Dia Modi, India's uh, most formidable corporate legal eagle. So excited to be sitting with you today. Thank you so much for joining us on ET Now. It's a pleasure. If you could just take me back to your childhood and talk to me about how your early years uh, were, given that your father was, you know, one of India's most successful Attorney General, Soli Surabji, being his daughter, uh, and of course your mother, who we don't know much about, but I believe has played a very integral role uh, to make you who you are today. So just take me back to, to those, you know, very, very early years. So I was the eldest child and the only daughter. I had three brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, in the early years, I remember uh, being spoiled by my father, being tossed up when I was young. One of our favorite places was a place called Mahabaleshwar, where we used to go on holiday. And I remember my father would pick up his anthology of poems and just trot off in the morning. We wouldn't see him till lunchtime. He would be sitting in the woods, reading poems to himself, come back and tell us pretty much how useless we were, that we didn't know all this by heart. <laughs> um, and so I think, uh, I would say a normal Parsi childhood growing up. Right. And, you know, a little bit about, you know, your, the role that your mother played versus the role that your father played. Uh, your father was a very, very successful man. At that point in time, were you ever in awe of the legal profession or was that just, you know, a blur and that came and manifested itself a lot later? I think what that helped probably is that I was not scared of the profession because I would hear these very chatty, uh, high decimal conversations of my father basically giving instructions about what had to be done overnight, where he had to be briefed where uh, the other side uh, had a strong point that we had to count, he had to counter. And so it was a fascinating uh, conversation that one heard. Sure. So there was no fear. The only, the only realization was hard work because, mm. you know, here was a man who was uh, at the height of his career before he moved to Delhi. He was in Delhi virtually Monday to Friday. We got him over the weekend. Um, and then it got uh, such that he moved to Delhi. And I think from my, for my mother, uh, so I, we always tease uh, our mother that she believed that if she hadn't got married to my father at 17, she would have been India's Nobel laureate for something or the other. <laughs> so she clearly believes that, uh, you know, her upward trajectory uh, was somewhat curtailed by the four children she had. So I think she lived her dreams through us. Yeah. Uh, in a positive way, sometimes a very intense way, uh, but always wanting us to excel. So you always wanted to be a lawyer? Pretty much. Pretty much. Tell me, uh, when you wanted to become a lawyer, when you decided, you made up your mind, uh, tell me about that story when you went and told your father this and he was a bit surprised because he never thought uh, that his daughter would want to follow his footsteps because he had three other sons uh, and the fact that he assumed that you would want to like, you know, get married, settle down and do the regular things. I'm not sure he thought that I would be a quiet wife. Okay. But uh, <laughs> certainly I think that he, he was anxious as to whether I would stay the course. Mm -hmm. Because uh, who better than him to know the amount of intensity of work and the, the ruthless, unrelenting pace uh, that he of course went through. Uh, and so I think uh, he didn't discourage me at all. Uh, he wasn't wildly encouraging, but he he did tell me that, you know, it's a hard job. I also think that he was quite keen for my brother, the one after me, to 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 take forward the last uh, family name. And uh, I think that that's another thing that my mother decided. She didn't want more than one lawyer in the family. So he became a doctor and he's a fabulous doctor. Okay. Uh, but I think my father maybe somewhere regrets that uh, he didn't have two lawyers, but uh, it's too late. Talk to me a little bit about Harvard and also getting through Harvard, uh, because that itself was a big deal. I always say that my one year at Harvard was the best year of my uh, educational life. Mm -hmm. it, was just, uh, it was just so much fun and frankly, it wasn't so difficult. I think there what you really learned was the power of forced analysis, uh, that was unrelenting. You were not asked to 
throw back anything that you had read uh, in that form. You had to absorb it, analyze it, rejig it, morph it and put it back in the format that the professor was asking you, which was almost always a curveball. <laughs> uh, and so, with everyone around you, the peer pressure of so many students from such an international uh, background uh, was another challenge that, you know, if the professor pointed at you, for God's sakes, how could you ever look stupid? That all made you much more confident at the end of the year that you could think. And then you, you, you landed yourself uh, a job with uh, Baker & McKinsey in New York uh, and you stayed there for a few years. Nearly four years, Nearly four years, years plus. Four years plus. You know, those days, in, th in those times, uh, in that era, you know, the legal profession was the male bastion really, right? And a woman was somewhat of an outcast in that profession. I wouldn't say outcast, I would say we were a minority. Minority, okay. And, uh, you know, like all things in life, you luck out on key people in your life that play a role for you. Sure. In New York, I had a fabulous boss. Uh, his name was Norman Miller. And uh, he really spent time training me. And in that environment where he was a senior partner at the firm, I didn't feel that I was being shortchanged because I was a woman. And uh, he always used to tell me, put the right hat on, Zia. So whenever you walked into an advisory piece or an m and piece or whatever it was, you first had to sit down, take a deep breath and think now, what hat are you wearing? What do you want to achieve? How are you going to achieve it? And then the next thing he always taught me was, what would the other side do? So there was no point in, you know, fighting the small fights. Because if you kept fighting, you wouldn't get a deal. And so the other side's problem was always something that I was taught from very early years to figure out what it could be, what we could give away, what we couldn't give away, what were the trades that you had to do. And so the entire way of negotiating um, in a slightly adversarial but not too adversarial manner uh, was what I learned in my early years at uh, Baker and McKenzie. You were in New York, you were working for one of the best law firms. What brought you back to India? My husband. So you were, you were already, uh, you know, childhood friends. Uh, were you dating before you left? You were already in a relationship before you left, even before you went to Harvard? Wow, that's long. So when did you start dating? Which, which year? I think when uh, I was probably 15 and he was 16. Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So and he was my boy next door. Your boy next door. And you continued this throughout the, the whole, uh, you know, on and England, off. Harvard. On and off, but more on and off. So uh, I think that, you know, uh, I was away a long time. I left in uh, 75 and I came back in 83. So that's a long time away. Um, and then uh, I think I, I convinced my mother to let me come back. Uh, and that's when the court, uh, the court uh, process started because don't forget in 83, 84 uh, we really had no international transactional M&A of the sort you see today. Sure. India was uh, still under the old FERA regime, the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. Uh, foreign companies were not allowed to hold more than X percent. Uh, a lot of the major MNCs were not going to play in that environment. So, uh, all the experience that I had at BNM, Baker and McKenzie, um, there was no one to uh, be the recipient of it. Mm -hmm. And so, rather than uh, mope over it, uh, I morphed into being a, a barrister, a litigator. And so, when I came back, that was when the shock actually uh, for the first couple of years oh, okay. uh, took place. So, okay. I was, you know, from a nice swanky cabin in Manhattan to sharing half a desk uh, with my new mentor uh, at that time. Who was? Uh, so he is a senior counsel called Obed Chinoy. Okay. And uh, again, a completely different set of training tools. Now you are only fighting. Okay. There is no transacting. And whether you go for an application that lasts for three minutes or three hours, it's war. You have to win. The other side has to be decimated in some form or the other. Sure. 
or otherwise you're tactically letting him get away with something to get him somewhere else right. or get her somewhere else. Right. And so the whole mindset was really, um, it was, how do we win? And we have to win. And there it was much more knowing the law uh, because you win with the facts and the law. So the facts you can master from the papers you have. The law you better be up to date. Sure. There were no computers at that time. Uh, no cases you could press a button and search for. Uh, I remember in my early days as a as a barrister, I literally used to have about 50 books laid out for me uh, at night for a case the next day, which would take me through the history of each case. Has it been overruled? Has it been distinguished? Uh, is there something out there which is open? What would the other side say? Really looking up all the cases that the other side would be citing. So I was ready to meet it or not meet it or figure out that I had a fundamental flaw in my case or had to brief my senior the next day. I was too young to open my mouth in those days. So really the way you proved yourself was to show your senior that you were willing to bust your chops. That sleep was not a problem. No sleep was not a problem. And that uh, little by little, uh, you started getting the confidence of tactically how you were presenting the case. Sure. Because don't forget when I came back, uh, I had not done a single day of Indian law in my life. When did you actually start litigating? When I came back, 83. First few years, no. who are you? No client wants to trust you. And you're a woman, right. a young lady. Right. And, uh, you know, how is this girl going to squawk and sure. win my case, right? So that was, I think, the the struggle and uh, I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. uh, there were very few women who were opening their mouths in court at that time. We were a strange phenomenon. Did that at any point in time, at that time, make you second guess yourself a little bit, shake your confidence? Yes, of course. Uh, more than shake my confidence, I was always nervous mm -hmm. as to whether I had missed something. And therefore, I think, you know, in hindsight, uh, there was too much over preparing. Sometimes you just have to let what I call the case digest and the matter digest in your system. Mm. So I think it was the over preparation that got to me finally, because uh, I just didn't want to look like a fool. Was, what was it for you to be Soli Sarabji's daughter? Uh, what are the kinds of, you know, own battles and dilemmas you had to face internally? to, you know, A, carve out a niche for yourself, extract, you know, extract yourself out of that shadow and say, I'm my own person. And of course, at the, at the same time, ensure that you meet expectations. So, you know, my father, by the time I came back, was living in Delhi. Mm. And in hindsight, that was a bit of a good and bad thing because, a good thing because he wasn't 10 feet away. And so his shadow was not looming so large over me. Uh, on the other hand, he wasn't close enough for me to really download the genius that he was. Uh, and I regret that even till today. So, uh, did I, could I really every day uh, just eat into his brain to figure out how I could do better? The answer is no. On the other hand, expectations I think he's okay. Uh, probably in the beginning, he was probably wondering if I would stay the course after marriage, after three girls. Uh, but I think he figured out that I would. Uh, then I think where he always says he was disappointed is when I stopped going to court and I morphed back into my MA practice. And that's where I think he felt that I had let him down in some way because. Obviously, like all lawyers, we do believe that uh, court is the elite of the legal profession. If you excel there, then that's where you make your name in legal history as opposed to a couple of M&A transactions. But uh, I think he's okay now. So tell me, when did you, uh, you know, set up Chambers of Zia Modi? Uh, at which point and which year? So, I think, you know, when the Manmohan Singh policy came in 91, right. uh, India opened up mm -hmm. and uh, that's when I started thinking I need to do more m and &E. And then by the time 
uh, my M&A inquiries and advisories and transactions really started. It was, I think, around uh, 94, 95, uh, which is when we formed this small shop called Chambers of Zia Modi. And uh, when you say we, you mean? Uh, well, we were, uh, I call us brigands, 12 brigands, band of brigands okay. who were just youngsters, uh, myself. And we were discovering uh, what FDI was and what uh, FERA was and uh, uh, what a due diligence report actually was and how to do it. And so we were, uh, we were just starting our shop. Okay. And how, how long uh, did uh, uh, CZM uh, last? Um, it lasted for a while and then uh, an old family friend who was also a lawyer uh, called Behram, Behram Vakil. He basically, much to my surprise, uh, came up to me and said, uh, we should be working together. And I hadn't even thought of it uh, because it never crossed my mind. We were just so busy, 22 hours every day, eating cold pizza, getting the next matter, figuring out where the law had changed. The law was changing every week. Wow. And so you just had to be current and that just meant time. Uh, and then when he came over, I thought, you know, that makes sense. So uh, on a handshake, we started and then... Uh, you set up AZB? Yeah, we set up CZB. CZB? Because Chamber the A of, hadn't come Oh, he hadn't yet emerged. And then the, and the A, bless his soul, uh, came in in 2004. So Ajay, uh, Ajay and us were on the opposite side of two or three transactions. And you know, I always maintain that you judge the character of a person more than a lawyer when he's on the other side. And I think that uh, when we did these two, three transactions, it was just some sort of instinct and chemistry. So again, like Behram, uh, we just uh, got together. But tell me, which was your turning point? What I think would have changed our image okay, perception, yeah, sure. in the legal world is really due to the House of Tatas. So we got, uh, uh, not the first, but the second most high profile deal that they did internationally where they bought Nat Steel, which sure. were covered several jurisdictions. And that suddenly put us in play with the international law firms. Uh, the client banking on us as their trusted advisor to take them through what was a complicated deal. Mm. Uh, the uh, the personalities involved. Uh, lawyering is also psychological counseling very often. And so how do you do that? How do you operate to get lawyers in Singapore, Indonesia, China, Vietnam, uh, all sort of come together for the benefit of the client? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you make your own traction and reputation with international law firms? So that was a huge learning for me. So, you know, many years have passed and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your leadership style. So you've been called a micromanager. You've been called a, a person who uh, does not like to give up control. Uh, so a control freak of sorts. You've been called a charming dictator. Uh, uh, and, you know, you have, you have led from the front. So a lot of people cannot say no to you because you're... You, you know, you burn the midnight oil yourself, despite being, uh, you know, a mother. Fat and old. <laughs> despite being a wife, despite having, you know, familial duties. Unfortunately, what I've been called is probably true. I do tend to get into a lot of detail. Uh, I don't like to con lose control over things that I think form the value foundation of the firm. Uh, I get obsessively crazy if we make mistakes on our letterhead because that's all we have. Um, and I'm glad I'm at least being called a charming dictator. But I think that, you know, my style has changed in the sense that uh, when we were just a very small firm, we were actually probably much flatter. Uh, everybody had the same voice at the table because everybody's voice was talking about the new stuff happening every day. Uh, there were certain legal calls to be taken, but it was a collect, much more of a collective call of 12 people mm. or maybe four people if sure, you like at sure. that stage. And then as we uh, just added people and added good lawyers and added practices and added clients, I think that, uh, you know, there was probably, a, I was learning on the way. 
learning what leadership should be yeah. and frankly making mistakes mm. um, and I think that the only good thing that I thank God is that I am intelligent enough to know when I make the mistake uh, I may not go shouting to the world I've made a mistake I've made a mistake but uh, I'm a clear uh, look myself in the mirror person I just know when I've screwed up and frankly a lot of my partners think I'm whacked out uh, you know why would uh, anybody want this sort of lifestyle you also you are a mother you are a wife you are a daughter-in-law and you you're pulling 12 14 hours of work even today and you've done so even more in your establishing years so where did you suffer it, it, I don't think I suffered as much as my family I think that uh, in hindsight in my younger days I would have spent more time with my family now I'm not sure they have enough time to spend with me, but uh, yeah, it's come at a cost. It has indeed, because uh, you know, I think for our viewers watching and for a lot of women viewers specifically who look at you as, let's say, an idol, uh, as a woman who has achieved so much in a, in a largely man's world, uh, you know, I think it's only fair to tell them what, that you can't have it all. Well, you know, there are many times that I think uh, maybe more so for women, but also for men, where you feel, is it worth it? Yeah. Um, why am I doing this? Uh, what do I need to achieve? Uh, what more do I need to keep on uh, uh, chugging away for exactly? Um, and each one has their own level of satisfaction and maturity. So I think to want to be some sort of uh, a uh, person who just feels they have to work for the sake of working is not what I would advise. And it's not that I'm advocating my lifestyle to most women because, you know, I lucked out in many ways. I, first of all, had an Indian husband who was secure, who had uh, not only no issue with his wife's success, but a great pride. But uh, I think it's it's also having a very supportive infrastructure. First of all, my own parents were so supportive of my career and my husband's mother, who I always say was really the reason for my uh, ability to go and work every day. So when I came back and I had three children, I was in court. There was no compromise from 11 to 5. You were in court. Uh, you couldn't say this is an M&A transaction, let's defer the meeting to another day. Sure. You were before the court and you had to win and you had to be prepared. And the client, frankly, was least concerned whether your child had measles or chicken pox or, sure. you know, he wanted his case fought. And the more you said, my child has chicken pox and measles, the more he said, see, she's a woman. So that was the dilemma that I used to face. But that's where my husband's two sisters, uh, Kalpana and Urvi, and my uh, mother-in-law, Usha, they were, uh, they were just there. You make it sound so simple, but I'm sure it wasn't. You must have got a lot of flack for being unapologetic about your ambition. Uh, you must have got a lot of flack where people try and guilt trip you for, you know, you being, you choosing uh, to be a career woman and uh, to being the best you, you are in your space versus being, let's say, uh, you know, a maternal, a uh, woman who is, you know, catering to all the needs and is available 24-7, which is broadly, by tradition, expected of a woman. So I think that, you know, a uh, couple of things. One is, the only flack that I think I have received, which was genuinely serious flack on occasion, was from my mother. And at times when it just got too much to handle, from my husband and again I think I was smart enough hopefully to back off at that time and understand that I was overdoing it uh, but you know uh, how do you change DNA which of your children have got your DNA none none <laughs> okay you know everybody knows how successful you are but I want to focus and I want you to bring to the fore some failures that you deem as failures in your life journey? Not some, quite a few. So you could start with uh, just not being the best young mother that three kids would expect. Um, I'm sure they have 
memories of where I wasn't there when they wanted me to be. They've either forgiven, but I doubt forgotten, and moved on. But uh, yeah, those are those are failures for sure. Um, failures in leadership. Got it wrong. Lost good people. Regretted could, it. Could you tell me a little bit about that? So I think you know sometimes you don't listen to what people are saying closely enough. Um, you think that you know more than they do. Uh, you are tuning out when they are giving you uh, maybe aggressive advice, but uh, honest advice. And you think you're, uh, you know, 20, 30 years younger than these kids, what do they know? Uh, but they tend to know a lot and they are the future. So you don't listen at your peril. And uh, what is the worst thing that can happen to you as a leader of a professional services firm? The loss of good people. But uh, I don't think that I have, mis I have made a mistake in the passion that I have allowed myself to retain. I think the mistake would have been to let it dissipate, uh, to let it become uh, less intense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think again the mistake is even today uh, at 60, should I really have such a day? The answer is clearly no. Uh, and I think the lesson I'm still trying to learn is how to just have a better day uh, and uh, maybe I'll get there. On that note, thank you so much. This Pleasure. has been amazing. Thank you. A very enlightening conversation and I hope my viewers enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much.